Yo, what is good, everybody? It is I, Rage Cage Twenty, here today. We got some more Mr. Ballin' for you. We have gruesome crime caught on camera, which I'm surprised that the title and video of this one has not been switched because it looks like very grainy and whatnot. I assume he would have switched to one of his more like. I, I attracting, I think is why he's switching these thumbnails. The more the, you know, faces up close and personal, and it's like, oh, get your attention, stuff like that. So it's interesting that this one hasn't been changed, but I hope he doesn't change it because I like it the way it is. Uh, what we got here looks like I see a street, a car looks like it's driving in the distance, it's kind of like an alley ish brick wall, car parked, and then like a bunch of trash compactors, and it's pointing at this dude. What this did. What gruesome crime this person could commit uh, on the on the on the side or uh, part of the city next to the street and whatnot in broad daylight in front of everybody, I do not know. I'm very interested to find out though. Got a nice short-ish one here. I'll see if it stays short-ish for me, but you know, I'm very interested to find out. So, Mister B, bring it all down here. Take it away, homie. Give me, give me an amazing story. Let's see what happens here today. The next time you're out walking around the streets of London, look up. Chances are good you will find a camera somewhere nearby. Because... Hmm. It's been a while since I've walked around the streets of London. Like Five-ish years since I walked around the streets of London. But uh, if I'm ever there again, I'll look around. As of publishing this video right now, today, London is one of the most surveilled cities in the entire world, with citizens being oh. filmed up to 70 times a day. Now, the reason for all of these cameras is to deter and more effectively prosecute criminal activity. But the vast majority of the footage, these hundreds of thousands of cameras all over London capture every day, is just normal people doing normal things. But, periodically, these cameras will capture people doing just horrible, illegal things. And today, I'm going to tell you the story behind one of those types of videos. Now, at first glance, the video clip, which we're going to play, will not be that shocking. But okay. trust me, with context, it's horrifying. But before we get into that story, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right place because that's all we do, and we upload once a week. So if that's of interest to you, in your will, please give the like button a treasure map that leads to a pot of gold. However, replace the gold with a $6 gift certificate to Blockbuster. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. Okay, let's get into today's story. That's pretty funny, because there's just about, I think, is there still only, like, one Blockbuster that exists anywhere? I think, isn't Hollywood Video done? Like, they, they could put skis, but isn't Blockbuster still got one in existence? Isn't, like, Bend, Oregon, or something like that? Can't remember. Or something like that. I saw a video on it. Oh, I just know, my roommate was watching a video on it, and I was cooking, and I watched the video while I was cooking. Anyways, um, so I I like the sound of the story. It's gonna because like you know again as I was looking at the pictures, just like I mean, what possible crime could be committed here? It looks like an average day, like broad daylight. Like who's gonna try to get away with the crime? The fact that it's gonna look innocent, but then once you find out, it's gonna be like, oh, that's horrible. That's exciting. Let's let's, let's do it. Let's get into that. It's exciting. On the morning of Friday, June 11th, 2021, in a suburb in the northwest of London, a man named David Klein woke up to his early morning alarm. David rolled out of bed, he got dressed, and he very carefully made his way downstairs to start getting ready for work. As David moved around this old brick house he was in, he was very careful not to make much noise because he didn't want to wake up his roommate, a 67-year-old widow named Deborah Chong. Deborah was technically David's landlord, but she didn't charge him any rent. 
The two had met in church, and when Deborah had learned that David didn't really have a place to live, she had immediately volunteered her house and told David to come live with her for free. David couldn't believe her generosity and immediately took her up on the offer. And then after he had moved in, he learned that he was far from the first person who Deborah had allowed to come and live in her house rent free. It would turn out Deborah, whose late husband had given her a ton of money in his will, felt like it was her responsibility and her duty to use her ample resources to house people that were kind of down on their luck. She said it was her way of serving God. Also, David got the impression that Deborah just liked having people living with her in her home. It made her happy. But David would notice a distinct change in Deborah's personality around the time the COVID-19 pandemic started in early 2020. At that time, Deborah, like many other people, was very concerned about this global health crisis and wanted to learn more about what was happening and what could happen in the future. And so the way she did that is she obsessively began going on YouTube and began consuming COVID-19 related content. That's how they get you, man. That's how, they, that's how, that's how mass, mass propaganda and panic starts, man. Like, you just like, oh, I'm scared about this. What is this? And you go watch people that tell you, oh, the end is nigh. And like, oh, you got you to gotta do this and this and this. And like, some of it might be actual good advice. And some of it might be the stupidest fucking shit ever. And you're just like, okay, that's what I got to do to keep myself safe. See, that's how you fuck up, Deborah. <laughs> Oh uh, man, you got you got to look for this. Not nah, you don't go to YouTube for your. Well, I mean, for some advice stuff, YouTube can be pretty useful. There are some like good channels like doctors and stuff that give advice and whatnot. But you, you want you want to go find like actual written reports and stuff from like the people that are actually working with this on like a personal basis, like doctors and nurses and scientists and stuff that do not belong to any specific affiliates like different kind of news channels or working specifically for the government and stuff like real people that are doing it on the day to day that aren't being paid to tell you certain things you know what i mean that like, that's where you want to get your information from anyways i i do i do like now that we'll pause here to mention this i do like that he's in the uh a foggy dark cloudy london street and uh, around Looks like just a little after sundown or something. I'm like, it's really cool. <laughs> I really like this background. And political content surrounding COVID-19 and the pandemic and lockdowns. But instead of becoming more educated and well-versed on what was happening in the world, Deborah's constant consumption of COVID-19 related content on YouTube really just made her feel incredibly stressed out and anxious. And as David began to see firsthand, Deborah's sudden high levels of anxiety really began wreaking havoc on her life. Years earlier, Deborah was officially diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia, which is a mental illness that causes bouts of psychosis, which is like losing touch with reality. Now, I don't know if this is a, it's a red herring or not, because like, I assumed in the picture or not that it was a dude. Looks kind of dude-like. And right now he's kind of painting it towards being Deborah here. So it's making you think, oh, maybe that is Deborah in the picture. Picture, but I think I think it's a red herring. I think it's a trick here. I think I think Mr. B's leaning into this. She started going crazy, so it's gonna be like, uh oh, she went crazy and then did something crazy. But I, I'm guessing it's gonna be a little bit of a switch. I'm still thinking David here. I think that was his name, right? David. I think he's gonna use the excuse of like, oh, she went crazy and she just left one day. He's going to use that as an excuse to do something illegal. Boom. Calling it right here, right now. Four minutes in. Time it. Pre-COVID, pre-pandemic, her symptoms were so mild that she basically led a totally normal life. But right. once the pandemic started and her YouTube quest for information caused that spike in stress and anxiety, it caused a spike in her symptoms. And so she began suffering from frequent and lengthy hallucinations and delusions. One time, David came home from work, and when he went inside the house, he found Deborah sitting at the kitchen table, diligently writing these handwritten letters 
letters to various British public figures. And when David asked her what she was doing, she explained to him that these British public figures were speaking directly to her through the YouTube videos she was watching. And so these handwritten letters were her response letters back to these public figures. In May of 2021, Deborah's hallucinations had gotten so bad that doctors intervened and forcibly injected her with an antipsychotic medication. And while these meds definitely reduced Deborah's symptoms, they also had some pretty negative side effects as well. Namely, they totally curbed her appetite and they made sleeping really challenging. And so pretty quickly, those two side effects combined made Deborah feel really weak and tired basically all the time. Yeah, if you're already having a problem hallucinating and whatnot, which that didn't even sound like much of a hallucination to me. It's just like if you're watching like these public figures, especially being someone who's older, who's not like super used to YouTube and the Internet. Um, you might just think like, oh, yeah, they're making these videos specifically for like people like me or for me specifically. It's like, I'll write them back and whatnot. That doesn't sound that crazy that just sounds like an old person being an old person <laughs> like, you know what i mean that, that sounds pretty normal that doesn't sound very hallucinative uh but if she was like watching like just animals in nature video and be like oh these are these are public figures speaking to me i must write back to them then be like okay yeah bitch crazy but like that's relatively normal um but uh yeah if you already have a problem with hallucinations and you know, you're not getting any sleep Oh, <laughs> I gonna get real bad, real fast. And uh, I mean, not eating a lot will kind of make you tired and weak and whatnot. But if she's also kind of starving in general, like not eating at all, that's gonna increase the uh, the hallucinations and all that stuff. So, again, I think it's hers. Those ones gonna not be the one doing something illegal, but having something illegal done upon them. To the point where she sometimes needed David to oh, literally hold her up by her arm just to walk down the street. Now, David, of course, had no problem helping Deborah with whatever she wanted. I mean, she had done so much for him, but David had work, and so he was only really available to help her mm. in the mornings and in the evenings during the week. And so he had actually spoken to Deborah about hiring a full time caretaker that could live with her and just take care of her at the level she needed all the time. And Deborah was open to it. She actually called a company that offered that service and they told her they would get someone out to her, but it would take some time before her caretaker was actually assigned to her. Now, David was really pleased with this development, but he really wished they would speed it up because again, every time he was away all day at work, he knew Deborah was home by herself. And so he was just so worried something was gonna happen to her when he was gone. So after David gathered up all of his things and very quietly made his way from the kitchen to the front door. So the plot thickens here. Now, unless David is just potentially a psychopath who just doesn't give a fuck, he now knows that there is some figure that's going to be coming to check on her at some point, at eventually. I don't think if you're going to do something illegal that you risk that they're going to buy that it's just like, hey, you guys took too long, she did something crazy, I don't know where she is. I don't think they're going to buy that. So unless this person's potentially a psychopath, it's starting to lean towards something, either Deborah or something else happened here. The, the plot is thickening now. He paused for a moment and said a silent prayer in his head for Deborah's safety and protection while he was away at work. And then he opened the front door, quietly went outside, shut the door behind him, and headed off to work. A few hours later, David came home from work, he went back inside of the house, and the first thing he did is he called out for Deborah. But Deborah didn't call back, and the house was very quiet, and so David took off his shoes. Okay. Now it's swinging back over to this one, swinging back and forth here. Swinging back over to David, because now it sounds like a confession. Like, this is like what he told the police. It's just like, oh, uh, yeah, before I left, I said a prayer for her in my head. It was like, oh, she's going to be good. And, oh, coincidentally, that was the day something didn't happen. I guess my prayer didn't get answered. And I came home. First thing I did, I was I called out for Deborah. Deborah, are you there? So, like, it sounds like it's swinging heavily back towards David here. 
Uh, but then again, this could be Mr. B's excellent storytelling trying to lead us down a red flag here. Or not a red flag, but a red herring. A, 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 like, oh, look at the cape over here. Don't don't see the dagger that's coming from this direction. Let's see. Uh, I'm not fully buying you, Mr. B, but I'm on to you. ...and walked around the first floor, kind of calling out for Deborah as he walked. But again, there was no answer. And so after walking the whole first floor and not finding her, he yelled one more time really loudly, Hey, Deborah, are you here? And after hearing nothing, he pulled out his phone and he called Deborah. And as the phone was ringing, he could hear Deborah's phone ringing upstairs. And so he thought, okay, maybe Deborah is upstairs. She fell asleep and her phone's just next to her on the bed. And so with David's phone still calling Deborah's phone, David began walking upstairs. And when he got to the top of the stairs, he just followed the sound of Deborah's ringing phone into her bedroom. And when he went in there, Deborah was not in there. Her phone was though, and so were her glasses. They were both just sitting on the bed. Those were two items that Deborah would bring with her anywhere she went. And so trying not to panic, David called out a few more times for Deborah, but again, there was no answer. And so after quickly searching her bedroom and not finding her, he searched all the other rooms upstairs, but again, she just was not there. She was not in the house. And so David began calling and texting friends from church and other people that knew Deborah to see if anybody had heard from her or knew where she was, but no one did. And the only people who had recently talked to her said she was totally incoherent, talking about spirits and demons and the destruction of all mankind. And so believing Deborah must be suffering from a schizophrenic hallucination somewhere out in the city, David picked up his phone again and he called the police. When the police showed up at the house, David filled them in on what was going on, and the police told him, hey, look, we'll go back and review all of the CCTV camera footage wow. taken from outside of your house. We're bound to see footage of Deborah leaving her house at some point, and then we can just watch where she goes. And so David felt reassured, and the police felt very confident. But when the police went back to the station and began reviewing all of this security footage taken from roughly outside of Deborah's house, there was no footage of her ever leaving the house. There was only footage the day before of Deborah going into the house, but she never left. And so naturally, the police went back to Deborah and David's house. Who? Who? Hold on. Let's get back here a second. Uh. Okay, watch this guy. See this guy right here? I'm pretty sure you can see. I'm pretty sure I switched this. You can see that. This guy who looks pretty masked up and who also kind of looks like the person in the picture. He's approaching pretty fast right towards her direction and it looks like he's specifically covering his identity. He, they, she, they, whatever. Uh, I assume he. I assume David. So I assume he, but uh, whatever. Whoever this is. Like, you watch them like, approaching her pretty quickly. Looks like they're covering their face, but it could just be the greatness of the the TV or whatnot. Like, I feel like we're getting to look into... Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know what happened here. Really, the police went He's back... The moon very fast. Moon very quickly towards her. All I'm saying to Deborah and David's house, and they thoroughly searched that house, believing Deborah had to be in there somewhere. But despite searching everywhere in this house, in every crawl space, in the attic, the basement, every closet, everywhere, she wasn't there. It would take the police nearly a month, but they would. Sorry, I'm pausing quite a bit. Uh, I mean, the, the uh, you know. Uh, I'll be these these ones specifically people don't follow usually in sequence so it's probably someone who's never seen me before and whatnot. I do this a lot. So for people who uh who used this is probably nothing new. Um <laughs> to those of you are not. I mean there's an X up there you can click if you don't like it, you know what I mean? Um my guess is that that person cloaked up, you know, well not David is gonna follow her into the apartment. And it's gonna come out later with a trash bag. Put the trash in the trash. And guess who's gonna be in the trash? He he dumped her body. Body got put into whatever they could, into the wheelie bin, as they say in London, <laughs> which is an adorable name for a trash bin, a trash can. Uh, <laughs> um, and that's gonna be picked up by uh, by a dump truck and just gone. Bet you ain't. Bet you money. <laughs> Not a lot of money, like a buck. 
But not all of you, only one of you. Only one specific person. You get a buck, if I'm wrong. But if I'm right, what do you owe me? Nothing. I just appreciate you being here. Anyways, let's keep going here. Eventually figure out where Deborah went. And to say they were surprised at where she went is a massive understatement. But to understand what happened, we oh, have to go back to the I very beginning of Deborah's very strange disappearance story. Sorry, I keep hitting for that time. Last weekend, I looked over and I saw old Seagull Lung sitting in his uh, miniature 1999 era G3. Is that actually, does he actually have a pet frog? Or is that just the name of the the pet frog he uses as an example for these videos and whatnot that he created or something? Or does he actually have a frog that he calls Seagull along? Because he could probably croak really loud. That's pretty fucking cool. I like that. Definitely not a virus. Hold on, let me, let me check this out. I knew I had made a terrible mistake. <laughs> this website is a virus, not an online vendor for MySpace View bots. <laughs> Unbelievably, that website was riddled with malware, and so immediately, my windmill-powered laptop caught on fire and then exploded, sending shrapnel raining down on me. <laughs> I do appreciate how, uh, how Mr. B works hard to make his, uh, his, his efforts and whatnot exciting and interesting and what, what have you. Uh, I just, I, I have hated uh, commercials and ads since... I was a kid and I was watching TV and all of a sudden here's a fucking ad and it's like here's a fucking commercial it's like another one fucking great uh but you know you just dealt with it because that's that's just how viewing stuff was but now that we have the internet and you can ad block stuff and never have to see an ad or commercial ever it's like why would you go back so now when these people have sponsors, it's like, yeah, you gotta shout out your sponsors, your sponsors, you know, help you out and whatnot, and you deserve to have a sponsor, and you should deserve to have some, someone helping you out for the awesome content that you create and whatnot, but I still fucking hate ads, so I appreciate all the effort that you put Mr. B to make them awesome and hilarious and entertaining and whatnot, but NordVPN can suck my fucking nuts, because uh, I'm so sick and fucking tired of seeing them a bajillion times on every fucking YouTuber's channel ever that they can go fuck themselves uh so no offense must be i appreciate you but i'm good i'm skipping <laughs> back to the story it all started about 10 months before deborah actually went missing in august of 2020 that month deborah met a 36 year old woman named Gemma mitchell at one of her church Ooh. prayer groups like deborah Gemma was okay i don't know who's blurred out here hundredth birthday god damn the plot thickens again maybe he ain't davy her face is so fucking shiny <laughs> was very religious and so the two women became fast friends despite being 30 years apart in age deborah sure. would confide in Gemma about her mental health struggles and Gemma would confide in deborah about her house slash financial troubles basically Gemma, a couple years earlier had given money to a contractor to fix up her house but the contractor had taken her money, not done any work, and then run off, basically robbing Gemma. But Gemma really needed to do these renovations, and so she wound up hiring a second contractor who did begin work, but during this process, Gemma realized she would never be able to recover the money that was stolen from her from the first contractor, and so when she realized she wasn't gonna get that money, she knew she would not be able to fully pay the second contractor for his work. Right. And so when the second contractor found out he was not going to get paid, he stopped work immediately, despite the fact that there was no working heat in Gemma's house, and there was a huge hole in her roof. But Gemma had no way to fix this, and so she and her mom were just living in this house that was just totally freezing all the time. Debra had been so moved by Gemma's situation that very quickly after meeting her, she offered 200,000 pounds to Gemma to finish the renovations on her house oh, under God. the condition that one room in Gemma's new house would be solely dedicated to Christian ministry. 
Gemma was overwhelmed with gratitude. She could not believe that Deborah was willing to do this for her. And so, of course, she agreed to her terms without any hesitation. After that, the two women began texting all the time about this renovation project. Deborah would suggest paint colors and different things to do with the inside of the house. And Gemma would text updates about the different contractors she had talked to who could do pieces of the renovation. Deborah was always inviting Gemma over to her house, and she even began referring to Gemma as her sister. And Gemma loved it because Gemma actually had always wanted to be much closer with her own biological sister, but they had kind of drifted apart. And so for Gemma, Deborah really did feel like the sister she was supposed to have. But their relationship was about to change drastically. In May of 2021, so eight months after the two women met for the first time, and one month before Deborah would vanish, Deborah was forcibly injected with that antipsychotic medication in order to combat her paranoid schizophrenia. And right after Deborah got this injection, she began treating Gemma totally differently. She basically stopped communicating altogether with Gemma, and then in the rare times she would text Gemma, it was just to berate her about being a hoarder or being too messy and sloppy. Gemma didn't really know what to make of her friend's new behavior, but she knew, you know, Deborah was going through a really tough time, and so Gemma just kind of took the abuse and didn't say anything. When Gemma did try to talk to Deborah by asking about the renovation project, which was quickly approaching on the horizon, Deborah would tell Gemma not to talk about it, that it was too stressful and just don't bring it up again. And then one day, Deborah just called Gemma out of the blue and said, I'm not funding the renovation anymore. It's over. You're on your own. Gemma felt. <sighs> Ooh, ooh, yeah. Yeah, old lady gotta go now. <laughs> she, she, hey, you know, old lady, she gotta get clapped now, man. It's, 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 yeah. <laughs> she, she done eating rings, man. Like, you know what? <laughs> like, Yeah, she 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 gotta go. I mean, I get it. Like the rest of the story now makes sense. She, she gotta go. I mean, it just yeah, yeah, I, I get it. <laughs> uh, that's, uh, now we have a motive. Totally devastated and pleaded with Deborah to please reconsider. But Deborah was not about to change her mind. And in fact, on this call, she would tell Gemma, you know, hey, you should just sell your house. And in fact, until you sell your house, don't contact me. And then Deborah hung up. Jesus. Gemma didn't know what to do. She felt like she really could not sell her house because it was kind of like a family heirloom that had been passed down for generations. You notice in this news that, I, I don't know if it started out this way, but this place is boarded up. This looks pretty heavily gated and boarded up right now. Yeah, <laughs> you know. And guess who done it kind of thing. Yeah. And so it just felt wrong to sell it. But on the other hand, without help, she would never have enough money to fix the house up. And so she was totally stuck and she felt like her only option was to go to Deborah and have one more conversation and just really plead her case. So, I don't know. I, uh, Like, first off, like, I don't know how the law system works in London compared to the U.S., but I personally would have, like, sued the first company for not doing their job and then just booking. I probably would have uh, created a long and lengthy court case that might not even even been worth it in the end. You never know, but I would at least attempt to sue them or get advice from a lawyer if that's a good idea or not. But uh, I don't know. It might be because I'm, like, not the nicest person in the world. Like... It's just like, I'm super nice until you cross me kind of thing. Um, but just like, it's one of those situations where there's like scumbags out there that uh, uh, that would do that. That would just like pretend to to renovate your place and then take the money and then leave. And you're just like, whoa, when the fuck are you guys coming back? It's not done. And they just, they just fucking bounce. Uh... I would go to that place. I would air that whole bitch out, man. Like, I'd just be like, I'm going to jail. <laughs> like, I would air that whole bitch out so they can't do that to anyone else. But, I mean, I don't know. That could just be me. I don't know. What are you, what are you, what are you going to do? But, uh, yeah, I'm having a feeling this conversation didn't go well. 
my assumption. ...and see if maybe there was some chance Deborah would change her mind. So on the morning of June 11th, 2021, so this is the day that Deborah goes missing, Gemma showed up on Deborah's porch and rang her doorbell. She arrived just after David had left for work. A few moments later, Deborah slowly made her way to the door. She opened it up. She saw Gemma out there and asked, you know, what's going on? And Gemma just very politely said, would you please let me come in? And can we just talk one more time about the renovation? And Deborah, who was not very enthused at the idea of having this conversation, said, you know what? Okay, come on in. And so Gemma would go inside and the two women would go sit down and they'd exchange some pleasantries. And then at some point when there was a break in the conversation, Gemma brought up the renovation. She had actually written out this whole speech about how incredible Deborah was and how these renovations, if they went through with them, would mean so much to her, Gemma, and her family. Right. But as Gemma is going through this pitch, Deborah just cuts her off and says, Gemma, I'm sorry, but my decision is final. I am not paying for the renovation. I'm sorry. A little while later, both Gemma and Deborah would leave Deborah's house. And there actually is CCTV footage that shows the pair walking on Deborah's street right outside of her house. However, the reason the police did not flag this footage when they first were scanning all of that footage to figure out where Deborah went is because when you watch the footage of the two women together, it actually only looks like one person. It looks like Gemma. But Gemma is wheeling a huge suitcase right behind her and as it would turn out, Deborah was inside of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's assumed that after Deborah was forcibly given that antipsychotic medication for her paranoid schizophrenia, that it really leveled her out. She was suddenly thinking very clearly for the first time in months. Oh, that wasn't her responding negatively to that situation that was a very spot funny like i'm not dropping 200 grand for this even in the name of god sorry hon <laughs> and i'm sure Gemma did not like that and in this clear state of mind it's believed she realized the 200,000 pound gift That's she was lot. giving to Gemma, someone she barely knew was a bad decision and so she very bad financial decision <laughs> just wanted to back out of it and so back inside of Deborah's house, when Deborah and Gemma are sitting there and Gemma is doing her speech to try to convince Deborah to change her mind, and Deborah is saying, no, my final answer is no, it's over. That's when Gemma snapped. She grabbed a blunt object, we don't know what it was, and she smashed Deborah right over the skull and fractured her skull, causing Deborah to fall unconscious and slump onto the floor. And then Gemma leapt on top of Deborah's unconscious body, Gemma pulled out a knife and she cleaned up all the blood or is that gonna come here soon I'm like god damn Gemma you brought the knife you were like ready to go what the fuck and cut Deborah's head off and then afterward Gemma cleaned up all the blood in the house Apparently. and then stuffed Deborah. Hold on, I took, I, 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 I expected throat. It took a second for that truly to sink in head off. The, whole, the You chopped that entire head off and you managed to clean up all that blood? God damn, girl. That's a lot of blood. <laughs> what the fuck? No, this bitch, this bitch didn't snap. She went full tilt. She went full psycho mode. Like, holy shit body and head into that big suitcase and then after Gemma stole several legal documents and a copy of Deborah's will she <laughs> walked out of Deborah's house with Deborah in the suitcase behind her Gemma would walk with Deborah all the way back to her house and then she would leave the suitcase with Deborah still inside of it ah uh, the, the, the picture it did look like they were tilting in the thumbnail uh, I thought the person's back was turned and whatnot. Nah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I do see the suitcases now. They they look like more of the trash bins, just kind of like ones that are kind of leaned over, like some kind of, I don't know, European trash can or something that you put stuff in. But no. Okay, I see, I see the suitcases now. All the way back to her place. 
Okay. Her backyard. She would just leave it there for two weeks. And then after those two weeks, Gemma would take the suitcase again, still with Deborah's body inside of it, and transport it 250 miles away to a seaside town where she would dump it. Dump and it. in oh, that yeah. seaside town, some vacationers would discover Deborah's body and call it into the police. On July 6th, 2021, police would arrest Gemma on suspicion of murder. When they arrested her, they showed up at her house and used a battering ram to smash in her front door. And then when the door finally literally smashed open, Gemma was just standing there waiting for the police as if she knew this was going to happen. And she just waited. <laughs> she, she looks like she just lost her entire spirit and mind. Uh, like she just kind of looks like, <laughs> like it seems like she just broke at that point. Like, she just full broke. Wow. I mean, honestly, I feel like... Like, this whole... Th like, I mean, some people might say it's an invasion of privacy or whatnot, because I think there was this thing that they were trying to uh, pose in uh, in Asia. I think. Somewhere in Asia. It might have been China, I think. I'm not 100% positive. To where they have... Uh, they like It was like a rating system for humans, to where if you did something good, like your rating went up or something if you did something bad even if it wasn't like illegal or not like your rating system would go down or something like that and you'd be judged on how good of a person you were or not that's a little extreme <laughs> that's a little bit of an invasion of privacy and whatnot but like you can catch more murders this way you know what i'm saying like there's like there's like we found those suitcases in the place that we have footage of you coming to uh we probably even have footage of you dumping it like we know too like you know you don't have to prove shit at that point <laughs> like we literally have you every step of the way on the camera last person we seen with them leaving with suitcases we found those suitcases with her body it's you you're going to jail like uh, it kind of makes it a lot easier really <laughs> so like i think the u.s should be doing that you know waiting to be taken away. When the police would actually go into Deborah's house and search it, they would find a fake copy of Deborah's will where all of Deborah's estate was handed over to Gemma and... How, how did she think that that was going to work? ...and Gemma's mother. In October of 2022, Gemma was found guilty of murder and sentenced to life in prison with a minimum term of 34 years. To this day, Gemma insists she did not kill Deborah. Of course she does. Why wouldn't she? So that's gonna do it. If you got something, God damn, dude. <laughs> well, you got a warmer place to sleep now. I I assume. I assume. Uh, England prisons are on the up and up. I wouldn't know. Um, but uh, well, you got yeah, you got a warmer place to stay. Uh, it's kind of too bad for your mom. Your mom was probably fucked. Because, like, if you didn't have the money to fix that place up, now your mom's living in a really ramshackle, shitty place. Well, yeah, yeah, that sucks to be your mom now. But how did you think that you were going to be able to plant that will somewhere to where a lawyer was going to get it and be like, oh, yeah, it's clearly say it's right here that you get all of her shit. <laughs> like, literally everything. Like, was she going to sneak it back into the house and just, like, place it back where it was? And so I'd be like, oh, yeah, no, right here it even says, all caps, all bold, Gemma is totally super awesome person. She get all my stuff. Uh, she didn't do it. I, uh, I'm weird that it says that, but it must be true. Like, how the fuck did you think that that one was going to play out to where you were going to be in the good and clear? Like, I don't. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I was wrong about who I assumed it would have been David, because obviously David seemed like the red, you know, the right person, but as I was su 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 suspecting, Mr. B was planting it to be like, oh, you're going to think it's him, but let's go back in time and let me tell you who it actually is. There's a third party in here that was not mentioned. It's like, ah, got it. And here's the motive. Got it. Yeah. But I did predict exactly what it was it wasn't trash it was suitcases but i did predict someone went in with her and came out with her but not in a way that you could see to throw her body away somewhere i did call it who called it <laughs> your boy called it <laughs>
anyways, I don't know if this is one that you can really have a lesson to learn from. Um, don't uh, don't pay contractors until the job is done. I don't again. I don't know what it's like in the UK compared to the US. I don't know how that works. I don't know if that's required or whatnot. And this happens all the time. It's a serious problem. I don't know. Um, but yeah, don't agree to a contract that's like, oh, you pay us as we go, or you pay us before any of the work is done. I'd be like, like now, I don't trust you, contracting motherfuckers. You complete the whole work, then I pay you. And if I don't pay you, you can take me to court. Like that, that makes sense to me, at least. I don't know. Maybe that's an American thing. I have no fucking idea. Um, but yeah, like, I want to, I want to pay them till the service is done. Um, because then you're fucked. But another maybe little lesson, um, like it, it's shitty when someone's like, "Yeah, man, I'm totally." I'm gonna pay you for this. Like, I'm gonna help you out. You're like, I, I got you. I'm gonna make sure that you got a nice place to live and and all this stuff. Like, I got you. And it's just like, oh my god, thank you so much. Like, you're literally my savior. You're amazing. You're awesome. I love you. And then like a couple of months later, they're just like, nah. Like the renovation's coming up. Are we still good? Nah, I'm not giving you the money. <laughs> like, that's really fucking shitty. That's a really fucking shitty thing to do. And like, I totally. Expect if you fucking hate that person for the rest of your life, and I get that, but like, I, I don't know. Like, one, you don't kill them, and if you're gonna kill them, don't chop off their fucking head. How did they clean all the blood by cutting someone's head off? That's blood everywhere, man. Like, how did they get that clean? Like, that's impressive, first off. And she just cut, chopped her head off with a knife. What kind of knife did you have, man? Like, holy shit, that was one hell of a knife, man. Like, fuck. Um, but, uh, yeah, don't kill a person because of that. But also, like, you could have easily just, like, it would have been really slow going. And you would have had to save up to get each individual thing done in the house. But, like, if if you had a way to put money aside, it probably would have taken years or whatnot. But, like, you know, you could have at least been like, okay, I'm going to pay someone. I'm going to get a deal with someone that's like, I'm going to pay them so much a month or so much every two or three months and they'll come out and patch a little bit more of the roof done or something like that you know so eventually i like, give it three six nine months or something and the roof will be done and then i can start working towards something else while i still have money to live and eat and everything but slowly putting some aside so i don't have to pay hundreds of thousands of pounds at once i could just pay maybe like a grand or two here or there to get at least little bits of this complete at a time you know I think probably would have been the smart choice. But anyways, uh, that's, that's really the only lesson you can learn here. I'm going to put this away within the next video. Um, so that's the only real like lesson you can kind of learn from this and whatnot. But I don't know. Anyways, good story. I like the I like the red herring twist in there. Really fun. Um, and that's going to do it here for us today. So thank you very much for joining me here today. I will see you all next time.